All right, so we have this hope that anchors us to this wonderful joy we have that, that has anchored people throughout the raging storms of this life because of a joy they have, one that, that brings them through sickness, one that brings them through bereavement, one that brings them through persecution, knowing that they may not see the next day. A moment ago, we heard this beautiful song, Arise, My Love. The Father raising His Son from the grave. What a great moment in time. The resurrection is significant, church. Significant. And I want to say it's not only significant today on April the 9th, but it has been significant every single day since the moment that Christ rose from the grave. It has changed history. It has given people hope. Hope for people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You may not know this, but today is an anniversary that deals with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who happens to be one of my heroes. He's famous because he wrote a wonderful book called The Cost of Discipleship. Kids, we may have found the next book for our youth group study. I'm just saying it. It's amazing. But he's also famous because he worked against Nazi Germany from inside the government. But you know, one of the things I really liked about him was this. He set up illegal seminaries in Germany during that time. Do you know that? He trained future preachers to go set up parishes throughout Germany, which would be illegal at that time. And do you know what his great lesson he taught them was? I'll tell you. Jesus first. Over politics, over government, over all these things, over even yourself. Do you hear that? Over yourself, Jesus first. It was after a failed assassination plot that happened that Adolf Hitler arrested him along with a whole bunch of other people. And two years later, 78 years ago today, Dietrich Bonhoeffer performed his final Sunday sermon. And then minutes after that, the Nazis walked in, said it's time to go, and they escorted him to the gallows 78 years ago today. Today, in honor of the living hope that Jesus Christ gives us from the resurrection, I'm going to preach a sermon that uses Dietrich Bonhoeffer's final outline. And there's a reason for this. There's, you know, I could come up with my own sermon but to think about a man who faced death and knew it was about to come and he preached a sermon about the living hope of Jesus Christ tells us, it testifies that Jesus Christ is risen and he believed it. It is my belief that in this lesson he told his people there in that room with him they have a living hope. And that living hope came because Jesus died and because he rose from the grave. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. This will be ESV. It will also be up above. But I like the sound of turning pages, and if you have your Bible, it's good for you to do that. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Dietrich Bonhoeffer started with this. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. You know, 700 years before Roman occupation, 700 years before Jesus Christ was born, he, was, he wasn't even a twinkle in his mother Mary's eye, Isaiah wrote chapter 53, prophesying the death of Jesus Christ. Why in the world would he choose that scripture? That seems pretty sad, doesn't it? 
to choose a scripture? Well, I believe that while they're there in the Flossenburg concentration camp, knowing that they were about to die, he chose it because he wanted them to know Jesus has gone through worse. And not only has Jesus gone through worse, it is because of what Jesus went through that you and I are forgiven today. The death on the cross, the blood that was shed. And I also believe Dietrich used this because if you're going to talk about the living hope, you first must talk about his death. Jesus was chastised. He was crushed. He was pierced. So let's just briefly talk about these things. The fact that Jesus Christ was chastised. When I think of Jesus being chastised, I think of that section in the week, the Passion Week, when Jesus is on trial before the Sanhedrin and he quotes, he says, he, he prophesies saying, Now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the, the, the gentleman there, what he does is he rips his outfit, and he says, that's blasphemy. Blasphemy. Does anyone need to hear anything else? There's nothing else to hear here. What do you all say? And they say, he needs to die. Then they start to beat him. And one guy says, as they're beating him, prophesy to us who has hit you. Oh, man, he was chastised. But not only was he chastised, we we're told by Isaiah he was crushed. Certainly was. Now the Hebrew word there for crushed, and you know when I think of crushed, I think of a can. You know, you crush it, and it kind of stays in its little space there on the sides. The Hebrew word there technically means crumbled. He falls into a heap. I think of the entire Roman company, Mark tells us. Not one, not two Roman soldiers, but the entire Roman company goes to Jesus, puts a purple robe on him, takes a crown of thorns and puts it on his head, and this entire company takes turns in beating Jesus, getting a staff and hitting him on top of the head where that crown is. And as they beat him, they are mockingly falling down on their knees and praising him. Certainly, he was crushed. Isaiah says he was pierced. We know, of course, of the nails in the hands. We know about all the piercings of the thorns from the crown. But also, we have the spear in the side. Done out of haste. As a the Pharisees go to Pilate and say, would you hurry this up? This is taking way too long. We want to be ready for the Sabbath. And so they take a hammer and they break the legs of the two thieves on either side. And when they come to Jesus, they realize they don't need to do that. He's already dead. So let's go ahead and get a spear and make sure he's dead. And they stab him through the side, causing water and blood to come out. Isaiah says, by his wounds or with his wounds, we are healed. These things don't happen for no reason. They happened so that we would be healed. They happened so that we would have peace. Question. Would you know about this today if the tomb was not empty. No. Would you have known about this today if the tomb, if that big stone had not been rolled away? No. It is because of the resurrection that happens three days later that we have the living hope. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer then transitions to 1 Peter chapter 1 saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that sounds wonderful. Hope. Hope is an important thing. Do you know that? In fact, in the New Testament, do you know that the Greek word for hope is 
It means expectation. That makes sense. Expecting, hoping, that works. But I really like the Old Testament in the book of Ruth. When Naomi is talking to her two uh, uh, daughters, and she says, you know, you need to leave because even if I wanted to provide somebody for you to marry again, it's not going to happen. And she uses that word hope. And the Hebrew word for hope, you know what it means? Cord. Isn't that odd? A tether. An attachment. As if she is somehow corded or tethered or attached to something else. In fact, hope is so very important because it provides a tether for the individual to have a healthy view of themselves in existence. And people who lose that tether, people who lose that hope, become hopeless. Have you ever known someone who was hopeless, church? Have you ever known someone that lost all hope, who began to isolate themselves, maybe becoming agitated with people they normally love and respect and honor? And when people lose hope, they turn to all different ways to, to deaden that, maybe drugs, alcohol, even pornography or violence. Did you know everyone in this world recognizes a need for hope. Really? I was actually looking online and I found a website called Extern. It is a social justice charity for Ireland. And they have this one page dedicated to hope, talking about this is what it looks like to be hopeless, this is what it looks like to be hopeful. Nothing about Jesus in here whatsoever, but they recognize the importance to have hope. In a person's life. Everyone thinks you ought to have hope, but everyone tries to get it or give it in a different way. If you want hope, just get the right guy elected. That'll give you hope. If you want hope, just Make sure that you change the laws so that you can get this kind of thing going and maybe have this kind of change. Then you'll have hope. Anna Street. You know what the problem with that kind of hope is? It's based on the things of the body. It's based on the human existence. It's based on the flesh. And what does it do? It decays. It dies. I'm telling you today, any hope that you place in anything that is ever only going to be temporary is DOA, dead on arrival, and it will only last a short amount of time. We have to make sure to put our hope in things that truly matter. And it starts with Christ Jesus, the empty tomb, the living hope. Let me, let me explain. Living hope means your hope, when you leave here, it is not inert. It is not something that does nothing. The hope you have is not just a definition on a page. It's not best, based on some guess. It's not based on a dream or a fairy tale. Anna Street, it is based on a fact that informs who you are on this world, how Jesus lives in you, and what he says through you. Living hope. You might ask yourself, Nathan, this living hope, what would this do for us? I'll tell you. few scriptures, Colossians chapter 1. We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now think about that for a moment. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, we have heard of your faith. Because of your hope you have laid up in heaven, we've heard of the love you have for Christians. Hope acting like a tether to the kingdom of God, to God himself, begins to change an individual. It bolsters their faith. But not only does that church, I'm telling you today, it teaches you how to love right. Teaches you how to love right. 
I'll tell you what, Andy and I, we've been married 22 years this next December. And um, I love her differently today than when I first met her. Because my life has been affected by the empty tomb and the way I live and the way I look at my wife. She's not just something. What I, you know what I tell my son and my kids? I tell them that other Christians are royalty in the kingdom of God, co-heirs. And so because of that, because of the fact that he is a prince and they, the two girls are princesses, they ought to treat other royalty like princes and princesses. And if they're a girl, then they better not be going out with any guy that's not going to treat them like that. Same thing for my son. We have this living hope which bolsters our faith and helps us to love appropriately. Number two, Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The God of hope, God from heaven. Remember, you are linked, you are tethered to God through this empty tomb. He fills you with all the joy. A joy is something that does not just go away whenever things are difficult, whenever things are hard, whenever things are sad. But it also gives you a peace which surpasses all understanding, which Paul tells the Philippians, guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It actually protects you. And you know what happens? It says the power of the Holy Spirit Helps you abound in hope. You ever heard that phrase, the rich get richer? The idea, in, economically speaking, if they got a lot of money, they can make a lot of more money. Guess what? The hope, people with hope get more hope. People with living hope get way more hope. They abound in hope. Number three, this one doesn't have a slide. Just an example, Apostle Paul. Paul was going around trying to rest Christians. And then he converted on the road to Damascus. Why? Christ is risen. And it affected Paul. One of the things I've noticed with our Gen Z culture, and I'll bet anybody in this room has asked this question. Give me a nod if you have. What's my purpose? Yep, me too. I'm nodding. See it? interesting thing is that the empty tomb that hope that tethers you to the kingdom of God it defines your purpose doesn't mean you have to be a preacher but it means whatever you do whatever you choose to do it needs to be something that, it, that, that can be godly. It needs to be something that gives you access to other people to be able to share the gospel, to empathize with people, to love on people, to invite them to church. If they don't go anywhere, your living hope gives you purpose. Fourth, finally, Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Church, what age? Present age. That just told us that we need to make sure to behave. The present age. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Waiting for our blessed hope. Once again, we're tethered to the kingdom of God, which is changing us. So that as we live with this, this tether, we start to see all the things of this world, all the godliness, all the worldly passions, and we say, you know what? That's temporary. That stuff's going to fade. It's flesh. It's going to go away. It's D-O-A, dead on arrival. There's no point in messing with that stuff. Instead, I'm going to let the empty tomb inform who I should be. I live for eternity. I will be different, self-controlled, upright, and godly lives as best as we can. A living hope gives us a desire to be more like Jesus 
wants us to be and less like the world wants you to be. A living hope, this is another way of saying it, a living hope gives a desire to be more like Jesus and less, if we're honest, like you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, he titled his book, The Cost of Discipleship, the very idea that you had to pick up your cross and follow Jesus, which is what Jesus said. Leave behind who you were and go forward being someone who's anchored and tethered not to this existence, but the kingdom of heaven. A living hope is important to your life today. I hope you live with it because it is that tether to a healthy Christian life. But I warn you, you have to develop it. You have to maintain it. You have to nurture it. Otherwise, it will wither like a grape on an unnurtured vine. Five things briefly. Number one, you must be born again. Two, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Three, and I will say this every Sunday, you must spend time in the Word of God. You got to study. Four, go to church. Go to church. Anybody like those Takis? Raise your hand if you like Takis. The youth, they raise their hand. All you other people are like, what is a Taki? <laughs> raise your hand if you like Cheetos. Okay, there we go. Yes, yes, just raise your hand high. Your wives will they'll give you a hard time. But I, I do like my cheese puffs. There's a reason for that. Did you know that when you hang out with people who are ungodly, they rub off like a Cheeto. <laughs> it's all over you. And then once you eat enough, <laughs> several weeks ago, Vivi, she just got finished eating Takis. That's why I said Takis. They get your hands red instead of orange. And she comes up, Dad, I love you running at me. And she just ate those. I'm like, stop. <laughs> Don't come any closer. I don't want that, but I like you. I love you, and not just like I love. When you're around Christians who live according to a living hope, who have a bolstered faith, who know how to love, who have joy and peace, who are anchored into eternity and not into this life, it rubs off. A lot less messy than Cheetos. I just want to point that out. And number five, finally, focus on the things of this world. No, do not focus on things of this world. Get that right. But instead, focus on eternity. If it's not good for the kingdom of heaven, it's not good. We allow this life to determine what we do. When we know as Christians that we will live in eternity with God, it's not even a blip on the radar. Why would it ever cause you to behave according to the way it wants you to? Let the eternity, let the empty tomb and the tether of the living hope inform your life. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer did. As the Nazis stood at the door and told him to come with him, he hugged all his friends and he said, this is for me the end, the beginning of life. Do you think he was focused on this world? No. And Jesus wants you to be focused on the empty tomb, the resurrection, and the kingdom of God. I pray that God will bless you with Dietrich's final outline and that you will be desiring today as you leave here to maintain and develop a living hope.